<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, Walter Rodriguez Meyer is a landscape architect, policy advisor and professor at Stanford University in New York, and a principal of local office landscape and urban design in Brooklyn. Uh, he founded the minority-owned firm, Local, in 2006 after working as the sustainability director at Cooper, Robinson, and Partners. Walter's career began at uh, Wallace, Robert, and Todd, which was originally founded by Ian McCark. Think Design with Nature. Uh, luckily for us, and I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to introduce Walter to the school and the school to Walter, uh, Walter will hold the Nancy Qualick Endowed Chair in Design and Planning uh, next semester. And this chair was established in 2016 to bring instructor, visiting instructors who are practitioners from, design, from the design and planning fields. These guest professors of practice are recognized leaders in interior design, architecture, landscape architecture, and community and regional planning. Uh, Walter will be offering an advanced design studio uh, in the spring semester. Uh, their practice oper is, uh, it operates uh, between community, infrastructure, and ecology. The firm has won awards from across the disciplines of architecture, landscape architecture, public policy, science, and art. Walter has engaged as a lecturer and a visiting critic at Harvard University, Yale, Columbia, Penn State, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stanford, UMass, University of Florida, UT, um, and Parsons New School and Pratt. Uh, locals built metrics, have helped shape national resiliency policy with three federal administrations, resulting in the White House Champions of Change Award uh, which was bestowed on local by President uh, Obama. Currently, local office is designing New York City's first net zero neighborhood, as well as three New York City Housing Authority campuses for cloudburst rains. The film is also working on the firm, excuse me, is also working on resiliency plans for the states of Mississippi, New Jersey, and adapting Miami to climate change uh, along with the Environmental Protection Agency. So please join me in welcoming Walter, and I look forward to you working with Walter uh, next semester. Well, it's great to be back on the UT campus. The last time I was here was 2007. Um, when I was a director of sustainability at Cooper Robertson, uh, we worked on the Breck and Ridge Tract uh, master planning work along the river. Uh, so I was here in a professional sense, but it's great to be back in the academic space here. Um, half my time is teaching and half time is practicing and building. So research and building is um, what I call action research, <laughs> moving back and forth between academia and implementation. And the firm theoretically operates between the fourth and fifth dimension of practice. And I'll go through those layers, what that means. Uh, it's very clear as an architect or a landscape architect what 2D and 3D is. I'll talk a little more about that 4D to 5D shift. Um, and so, uh, you know, some of the first ecologists to call themselves ecologists um, operated within a kind of a 3D model of nature. Um, this model on the top is a drawing made by Frederick Clements. Um, you know, the first, first person to call himself an ecologist and kind of the father of the ecology. Uh, and his model for nature was what us landscape architects call a secessionary model. It's that nature starts with a bare field on the upper left there, and it transitions you know, through time and creates a stasis, a, a, a oak hickory forest climax. And Frederick Clements was researching the northeast uh, woodlands outside of cities, and this was his static model for what that could be. And this became the premise for sustainability um, many decades later, uh, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, but that generation of uh, ecologists, while they set the stage, their model was correct. But the next generation of ecologists, um, including the, the Odom family, is a um, family of 
modern ecologists that came a generation later, they pointed out that Frederick Clements was not wrong, it's just his model was incomplete, and it was a 3D model, it was spatial. And what they proposed is, and, and you can see how that dash line fits into their model, their model is a four-dimensional model. It's not spatial, it's relational, and it's time-based. It's based on cycles. As you know, the 4D model is time-space continuum. And in their model, they said, um, you know, the snapshot was really just taking up one piece of, of how nature works in abstraction. But if you abstract nature with this model, you can then recode it with natural systems as well as man-made systems, and you start to realize they're inseparable. But one of the catches of sustainability is it assumes that there's separa separation of people and nature, and if we're more like nature, um, we can take care of the planet and take care of ourselves. The 4D model says, um, in abstraction, there is, let's see this line here, there's a dynamic, um, a predatory prey relation in nature. So let's say that a wheat field uh, grows through the season and then it collapses right at the fall harvest because of a locust outbreak, right? Predatory prey relation, the wheat field and the, and the, the locust. But that's a natural system. Now we can recode that because it's abstracted with a man-made system that is capitalism, the free markets. Uh, Raise your hand if you've seen the movie The Big Short. It's about the 2008 financial crisis. Really good. Like majority of you have seen it. Really good film. Um, and so The Big Short was about the rise in this line of your housing market, right? Uh, and then we have default swaps or predatory lending that emerges as this parasitic relation to what is a fairly regulated market. And that collapses, and that's the 2008 financial crisis, right? And then we merge into the next cycle, which would be the pandemic economy, right? And so there's a, another set of economic factors. And what's interesting about that is when you abstract nature and recode it, you realize we are inseparable. Our systems as humans are inseparable. The 4D model points out that we are nature. We walk around with our stomachs full of billions of bacteria hosting them, and being permitted to exchange between carbon and oxygen on the planet, between plants and animals. Uh, and so we, if we see ourselves as inseparable, it becomes inefficient to extract from nature because we're extracting from ourselves. And so this is really important because in, a, in the era of regenerative design that is emerging in academia and starting to become a, a professional policy moving forward, um, that, that appropriation, that extraction of nature is starting to be dissolved and looking at nature-based systems within a city in so many ways that are indigenous-led. So that's the 4D model. Now, by definition, the fifth dimension is defined by energy, right? The science definition of the fifth dimension is energy. But that could be expanded through this emerging field called quantum biology. Quantum biology starts to explain why our DNA affects protons, our DNA affects dark matter, our DNA has been put in vacuum tubes in experiments, and the vacuum tube before the human DNA was put in, lights, uh, the proton, was evenly distributed in the vacuum tube. But when the DNA was inserted, it created a light pattern of, of protons that were not evenly distributed. And when the DNA was removed, that pattern is a state. And so this is an emerging field that you can expand energy to not just mean literally solar panels and kilowatts, but that spooky dark matter that's emerging in science. And it's also the cultural acts. And, and the expansion of the studio for next semester will be looking at these acts of culture making, humanities, justice. That is that expanded definition of the fifth dimension in the practice. And when you look through this shift from the 3D model to the 4D, from sustainability to resiliency and regeneration, what emerges is when you, you know, look across the ethical space and the ethical sea and the Jewish environment and energy imperative, as well as the Pope Francis encyclical on climate change and the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change, 
all of them are agreeing that we're not separate from nature anymore in a lot of the late religious thinking and how can we operate knowing that we're inseparable. It's a very different assumption. So things are changing in many spaces. And so that 4D model starts to impact our practice, both in research and uh, in the discipline. And that is, you know, we get asked by governments who have, are responsible for the public dollar and making sure they're getting the best return on investment of that public dollar. We get asked, what, this is a time scale from top to bottom, but the geology operates in billions of years. Topography is influenced by geology and operates over millions of years. Hydrology is influenced by hundreds of thousands of years. And now we get into our zone, habitat influence over hundreds of years, and then fauna and the Earth's history is over decades. And so that collapse of time exponentially is really important because that four-dimensional model means when you're making design decisions on the site, are you tapping into systems that are in the billions or systems that are in the decades? And they all line up today and have an impact economically. And so when I'm asked by folks who are in charge of dollars in the governments or in public-private partnerships where they have investors that they're responsible to, they ask, I love this idea, I love this diagram, but how does it, that's something that happened a billion years ago affect our return on investment today? <laughs> and so we go through that. And the, one of the primary issues is, is, is where we get our energy. Um, and as an efficiency measure, um, taking geothermal energy, whether it's deep geothermal from volcano, volcanic action, or, or mag, let's look the west coast, from the heat of the earth, or from uh, water source heat pumps, which is just the groundwater temperatures. These are things that are usually left to engineers to decide, but our firm has positioned ourselves as a one-stop shop for nature in the city, and that means handling campus planning, geothermal districts, thermal districts, underground design, subsurface design, and the bulk of our work is not that visible. It's managing resources underground, including soil design to manage stormwater, uh, and then the things that operate at the surface, um, you know, might only be 40% or 30% of our thinking at the office. So that's kind of interesting to think of this deep section of the city or of the ecosystem uh, and having a majority of your effort be underground um, in order to connect the dots between the city and the bioregion. The other piece, um, a decade ago, uh, design thinking grew like wildfire in the corporate space, in the non-design world. And it was taking the principles of design, of architecture, and applying them to corporate governance. What hasn't hit the world yet, I believe, is landscape thinking. Mm -hmm. And, and it, what has happened is you know, ecosystem approaches, but ecosystem, you hear in a lot of, um, you hear Elon Musk reference to that, and a lot of the Silicon Valley students that I teach, a lot of reference to the ecosystem. But it doesn't capture the cultural interaction of the ecosystem and the city the way landscape thinking does. And a lot of policy is starting to be influenced by landscape thinking, landscape thought, or the landscape approach. And the, you know, I, I mentioned the fifth dimension of being about energy. Sometimes that's literal. Um, you know, even after a disaster, showing up at a site after a hurricane, such as this was Hurricane Sandy in New York, where there's a FEMA generator that was brought in place, but it, nobody changed the oil and it burned out. It almost caused a fire versus putting a solar battery system that a community can get together and support. And so a lot of the work um, out of this project, it was called Power Rockaways Resiliency, was showing a social infrastructure that could be leveraged with investment from the government but one of the challenges during the Obama administration was a lot of federal money has, in a disaster has to move from feds to state and then to city and then finally a community. And it takes a decade to move that much money. Uh, and so there's one of the first uh, kind of pilots of testing how the White House could fund through FEMA directly to the community. And that was an exciting time because 
that moves government uh, assets quickly at the speed of a recovery. And so what started as a self-organized project to help the community that builds a lot of our projects in New York, which is on the coastal zone in, in, in New York City, um, through you know, started as, as foundation fundraising, which is rapid, and then being scaled up by federal funds. So this uh, was you know, several community hubs that were already self-healing as part of the Sandy recovery in New York in 2012 and 2013, were backstopped with these solar battery systems to tur turbocharge their capacity to self-heal and shift from when the power is out, you can only do one shift of volunteers. There are, it's New York City, so people are coming on bikes with, uh, until the blackout, would, you know, the blackout would cause us at sunset. You, you have to stop working because it became unsafe because of looters. But this allowed a, a, a triple labor force. So instead of a, a four to six hour work zone, we were now working around the clock, 24 hours, because we had lights based on a small battery system. And it just caused looters to go to another block, right? And it's just this basic, safe, stable energy. It's not a big load, but it's enough to create safety on this block uh, and reduce risk for that neighborhood. So it shows just how efficient that little bit of dollar can go in such a long way in the energy space. And that evolved over time to starting to advise the White House on future policy that would be long-term impacts on FEMA's policy. So one of the examples is taking a project that I'm about to show from Puerto Rico that was designed in 2006 and finished, opened up in 2009, three-year process, um, and how the metrics from that project using natural infrastructure, that is meaning dunes and wetlands and coastal forests instead of pipes, pumps, and seawalls, the, the green and blue infrastructure versus the gray infrastructure, what is the cost for the capital, the cost to build it, was the cost to own it, uh, and how is it performed under Cat 5 hurricanes? That's what governments want. They, that's how you shape policy. They want metrics. They want to know not the computer model, but the ultimate model, which is nature and how it affected. And a lot of the metrics from that project started to upload into this, these policy papers over time. In this document, if you look at the date, um, 2015. And just last week, we had a watershed moment in FEMA history where they took this making, which was you know, influence over consistent policy influence over years that was design-led policy making, which is incorporating natural infrastructure and ecosystem services and federal decision making. So FEMA just announced that they are now going to do what this was proposing from 2015, now this year, this month, that we, it will be required that in future disasters, that hard infrastructure, which is a well-known uh, cost-benefit ratio that exists, they now are required to run the, the numbers on natural infrastructure. It used to be an add-on, like, but it would never actually happen. But this requires them to look at the default. And it's pretty exciting because when you run the numbers on the cost of a surge barrier versus a, a dune system, the dune system is going to win every time, right, in terms of costs. And the New York District of Army Corps of Engineers knows this. And a commander of the Army Corps was educated as a landscape architect. His name is Colonel Tom Asbury. Tom Asbury is unique within the Army Corps districts because he's educated as a landscape architect, but he's managing engineers. Most of the leadership in Army Corps is engineers. And you need engineers to deliver this stuff, but it's a landscape architect that can think horizontally through the system, not just about nature, but about governance, about policy as a landscape. And, uh, that commander ended up retiring and joining our firm and became our federal works director. But it was an exciting time when he was in charge of the New York district because Tom, or you know, now he's a civilian, he's Tom, he's not Colonel Asbury. <laughs> uh, Tom, he, of all the districts across the U.S., you know, from New Orleans to Jacksonville, which covers Miami, Jacksonville also covers Puerto Rico, West Coast, none of them were introducing the amount of nature-based systems that Tom was leading under his leadership. We're talking building islands, oyster reefs, uh, you name it, the Army Corps was doing it. 
and it's an exciting time because now we have projects finally getting built under from his time making decisions as a landscape architect in the federal space. And so as we shift from design-led policy in federal space, and this is a long, persistent influencing of policy at all levels, state, city, wherever I can plug in, we're showing what landscape thinking can do beyond just landscape architecture, right? In so many ways, the profession of landscape architecture has some very big shoes to grow into with the era of climate change. Our scope has magnified massively. In many ways, the way we teach landscape architects has to change in order to catch up to that growing scope. If not, other disciplines will take that scope. And it's not a tension between disciplines. I'm not talking about architects. I'm talking about in the corporate space. There's people talking about green infrastructure, do all the things that landscape architects do and have no idea what this profession exists at all. So it's interesting to think about that. We're such a small profession that already in design, we're lucky if people know what an architect is and what they actually do. But within that discipline, there's other disciplines, even smaller. <laughs> and most people ask me, what does a landscape architect do? When I show them the systems, they're like, oh, that's obvious. Yes, I know that. But I didn't understand what landscape architecture was. And that's because generationally, there's, it's been a, you know, from Olmsted, we've come a long way. Um, and a lot of the new leadership, uh, what I found is um, we're a minority of firm, but we don't check a box with that minority. We don't, we're not arriving at equity and call it a day. We believe that genius is evenly distributed in humanity. And if you come into spaces, whether it's where the sausage, sausage is being made in the White House, or if you're coming to spaces where your discipline is managed, such as the ASLA, if you see one type of person, whether it's all engineers or very wealthy people or people of one ethnic background, something's being lost for society, right? Really important diversity of ideas. So for our practice, equity is the path to the beginning of intellectual diversity. And that's a really different approach than just saying, we need more brown folks like me operating in this space. It's not about just that, that's important. And that we need more women landscape architects. We need that, but there's so much more that can happen when different perspectives come in to power and into decision making. I come from an indigenous culture in the Andes. There's a thousand year old city called Chia in the Andes. And when the Europeans came and, and, and appropriated a lot of what they found was gold in our culture, and a lot of the matriarchal led societies, such as the Moisca, um, the Moisca tribe, um, the matriarchal societies were typically, st they stayed in place and they grew food and they were able to um, mine for gold. They were not the warfaring tribes. You know, so the Moisca was a trading tribe between the Inca and then up north to the Central American tribes. But because it was matriarchal led, um, it was really about production, about making food and having a level society, a cooperative society that was horizontal in nature. There wasn't a lot of power being uh, expressed. In fact, power was not understood. Ownership of land was not understood. We were always passing through and being stewards in our time for the seventh generation ahead. But the Moisca is amazing because Chia, the city, means the moon god. And my mother was an immigrant from Colombia, and after a thousand years in this one city, my great-grandmother knew her great-grandmother going back not almost a thousand years, um, moves to Miami, and I'm born in Miami. And I, growing up, was told I was Colombian, but in, in, made inquiries to my family in Colombia and found out my grandmother's sister showed me this piece of uh, uh, carving. And she says, this is from the caves outside of Chia on our family farm that we've not owned for we don't know how long before land was owned. <laughs> you know, so. And she said, this is from the cage. She said, uh, somos moisca, no somos colombianos. She said, we're not Colombian, we're, we're indigenous. And I was like, that just blew me away. That yes, in Latin America, it's not all Colombia. But she says, the important thing is that in order to kick out the Europeans, we had to organize with the African slaves, meet in Chia and make our way to Bogota and create the independent nation of Colombia. 
So that work of decolonization, I learned from that generation, that they weren't focused on assimilation in the United States and immigration, they were focused on preserving their culture as Moiska, and they've lost their language over time because they're very close to Bogota. But this work that I see of decolonization of that effort, what I was told by them is that the work that I'm doing now would be the same as your ancestors, just new technology and new ways of thinking, but it's all the same. And that feminism and, and cooperative thinking and indigenism are very parallel thinking, it's very horizontal. And so the focus for society, if we can influence society in the new era of regeneration, is going to be to shift towards away from power, away from the vertical structures, more to the horizontal, shift from the competitive, extractive nature to one that is cooperative and sharing. And so, thankfully, our Lemoiska tribe is part of a larger confederation called the Chicha Language Group. And what that means is, before there were nations, it was all one confederation. And there's other tribes that extend as far as Costa Rica that speak the same language. And the language has been lost in, in Colombia, it's barely intact. But there's speakers in Costa Rica this, and, and, and knowledge carriers who have been intact <coughs> on reservations and have not lost connection to the land and their culture's intact. And there's multiple tribes. <clears throat> and what I've learned is, even in Latin culture, there's a colonial name for a tribe, and there's what the tribes call themselves, right? So, colonially, our, our tribe is called the Chicha, which is actually an insult, because that was just our language. We're actually called the, the uh, Moisca. But in Costa Rica, the same language was spoken, and this is uh, an indigenous group that the colonial Costa Ricans called Guaymi, but the, the local tribe calls themselves. It's spelled Engabe, but it's Noves, right? So the Noves indigenous tribe. And there's a few other tribes, including the Chorotega. Why am I talking about this? Because going back and bringing my uh, energy to Costa Rica and learning both as a personal agenda to connect to the roots, but also to bring the professional work in and how can the global economy center new indigenism and, and not just borrow their knowledge, but center, center them in the economy. And this was a project where you know, we showed up on their property and asked them, how can we ally with you and how can both the government and public-private partnerships support and center the economy that you're struggling to participate in? One is, we've learned that this, this tribe doesn't have any young generation that's staying, they're going to the capital, San Jose, because there's jobs in law and professional jobs that pay better than anything they can do on the reservation. So they think that this is the last generation of knowledge carriers, and it will be gone in 20 years. What we want to do with this project was create enough salary to bring them back, not out of the romantic nature of wishing they would come back, but actually making it so they can make more money here engaging in their knowledge into the next generation. And so how we seeded the project is, this was called as a regenerative retreat, a fifth dimensional retreat. And we're not talking about ayahuasca trips. This is really understanding how these tribes are governed and how it can influence uh, decision-making globally. What the regenerative retreat does is brings global leaders from around the country and it may have contracts with the federal government that does therapy or trauma-informed uh, retreats where you come in and you take on micro-risks and then micro-successes micro and you build confidence over time. So, for example, they would take FBI agents from the front lines dealing with some severe incidents and come for three-week retreats and really just be in a nest of love and nature and healing uh, and then go back into the front lines and see community different in the way it might have been as just fighting crime. Um, and so there's many, uh, some of the different groups had different expertise that's remnant from their knowledge. In this case, this Chonotega uh, matriarch, they're, they're experts with uh, geochemistry. They can find, go onto your site and find uh, the right mix of clay and sand soils that are appropriate or making pottery, or in this case, we understood that they can make 
three-dimensionally by hand, but they influence 3D printers and, and advise us on bringing on the site and minimize the importation of materials using their expertise or designing shingle pieces for the architecture. Um, and so also the, there's a land back movement, which is giving them property on this project to own and have their own place within the project. Uh, so there's many layers and reparations are not always about just giving money. It's also creating space for them to participate in the global economy uh, and allowing them to step into their own power and not empowering by you know, the, the savior of giving someone power and allowing them to have it. No, this is just making space for them. And in the design process, a lot of folks ask when they see our design work, why are the projects so different each time? Uh, and that's because we take the analysis very serious. It's a very expensive process. And uh, we ask for the slow design movement, which is to really think slow and deeply from the community, from the environment, and extract from that what is about 90% research. Between 10% becomes a form giving, and it comes from that analytical work. But it's to become original, authentic at a time when we're taught, or at least when I was in grad school, I was taught that really nothing is new uh, anymore. Everything's been done before, and we're just curating things that we've seen, and they just pop in our head, which is, that's true. But what's interesting when you talk to folks with different perspective and approach it with a co-design process, I mean, you don't come with your predisposed sketches or ideas, just let it stew for 90% of the scope of the project. And then the whole very end, it tends to snap into place what it wants to be. And it's not a very heroic move uh, in terms of design from the top down. Uh, it's certainly more of a spirit. Um, and I'm not sure where this is going, this approach, but we've been had a few affirmations, including uh, the project I'll show you shortly. Uh, had Ai Weiwei, the artist, come visit our project. And he said the same thing. His art is 95% research, and at the very end is one little move he does, and that's the art piece. And he says that's where you tap the ego, keep it in the back seat, but manage it. But there's time where the ego uh, learns from nature and community and, and creates form. Now, there's a whole other way of thinking. You know, as a male in Western society, you're all about to kind of manage the ego. <laughs> but there are times where and I was told this by a feminist artist named Agnes Dennis, who I collaborated with on a project. My heroes are becoming my peers now that I'm getting older. <laughs> and she says the, the ego can be uh, a place where war can be created. It can also be a place for the imagination for beautiful things to be created. It is our humanity. And she says you know, have to step into that power, but also know how to manage it. So that was interesting to learn. I was always about, you know, raised by strong women who are like, manage the ego, suppress the ego, and I realize, no, there, there's a place for it, and, it, and we have to be aware of that power. And so a lot of this, this is compressing the analysis over scale and time, but really going through how computation can take those Ian McCard foundations, those whispers of nature, and amplify them in, in one layer at a time for crystal clear decision making whether it's you know looking at slope, looking at elevation, looking at wind, um, and let's see if I can get it to go again. Uh, and it's zooming down on the different topics. Uh, and so this is you know six months of work before we actually design something. And to get clients who want to do that, it's very rare because they have to start building quickly. So sometimes we write parallel grants to support this. Or in the case with a project like the EPA, we're adapting from the city of Miami to climate change. Um, we set the schedule and we set the budget. And we said, we're not certain what the big budget will be for construction, but we're gonna create a dozen pilots that will be a transect for the city to reconnect the Everglades to Biscayne Bay and restructure the city to adapt to climate change. So sometimes you're doing projects where nature is your client, not the time commitment or not the budget commitment. You put that aside and just focus on nature as the client. Um, and so, you know, this is Costa Rica, this is that regenerative project that I mentioned with the, the, the indigenous group. Um, and what we found is, and this is the nature of Costa Rica, is there's industrial agriculture. There's um, oil palms and there's teak plantations. 
which tend to strip the soil or make it too acidic so nothing else can grow there. So a lot of opportunity to regenerate what was there a thousand years ago. And what we're learning is waterfalls used to flow year round, but in the dry season they dry up now. And so how to restore that steady state flow through regenerating the forest, but tapping into an indigenous led knowledge that not only borrows their knowledge, but centers them permanently into the project. And the client didn't ask for this. This was our agenda. And he said, we hire you to design a beautiful regenerative resort. How do we do this? And we said, well, first, let's go visit the tribe and learn what their needs are and center them in this. And they said, that's amazing. We want to do that. <laughs> and so they really took off with it. But it was a kind of a, a risk. I could have lost the project. They're like, that's going to waste time. That's going to waste money. But he had to lead with why, like why we have to do it. Uh, and then we get to the how. So. And in the end, the project is, it's, uh, you know, it's on a hilltop overlooking in the Sar, Costa Rica, and the North Pacific coast. But, you know, a lot of the settlements, uh, you see your, you know, tight housing, but you see a lot of where in indigenous forms, uh, you know, transferred into the project. And what's guided from it is, is understanding hydrology is the number one connector. A thousand year rain event is modeled on the site to tell us where the invisible it becomes visible. And connecting the dots between these corridors, with new bio corridors that move animals across town, as well as uh, greenways that move connect people. It's very low density, and it can apply to a city as well. But this applies to every layer in the system. So infrastructure design, using natural infrastructure, can apply to energy, can apply to waste, can apply to water. And it's a, a, a deep section and cycle movement happening in white in the diagram, but it has a physical manifestation that the architecture came from this whole process. So we, you know, the architect waited until we were able to present all this information, and then we got it together and sketched from the inside out what the architecture could become, but our process was from the outside in, and we kind of met in the middle. So I'm going to talk about waste for a second. We're jumping to Puerto Rico. This is another coastal project, um, and this was a small eco-resort type project where uh, we designed this before Hurricane Maria in 2017, it hit Puerto Rico. This is the northwest coast. My father lives in Puerto Rico. He's been there for almost 20 years. My stepmother is from the south coast, from Ponce. Um, and so this was an abstraction of a sargasso seaweed. Sargasso starts its life in the center of the ocean, or excuse me, starts its life in the ocean and then ends on land. And sargasso seaweed becomes stratified layers of nutrients for the dune systems. The vertical roots of the dunes tap into occasional layers of sargasso. So when you see a dune system in the tropics or the Caribbean, there's not a lot of sand. It's actually a lot of roots and sargasso layers built up. So they're, they're very resilient against storm surges if you allow this system to interact. But we hired as a subconsultant a NASA engineer, an engineer who worked for NASA as developing a wastewater system that's a zero waste system. So your toilet water can be completely reused. Um, and so the metrics from that were borrowed from Biosphere 2. Biosphere 2 was a big glass, five acres under glass in Arizona, that was the model for which to terraform on Mars or on the moon. There, there's a lot of really good uh, documentaries about Biosphere 2 but one in a lot of failed experiments. But what was amazing is the wastewater system was superb, it was perfect, and, the, and it continues on doing this work. So we brought them into this project. I apologize the resolution's kind of low, but it shows that with just about 500 square feet of this landscape, we can take 10 toilets into the system separate solid from liquid, and the liquid goes into a gravel-based constructed wetland. There's all gravity-based, there's not a lot of pumping going on. And it completely polishes that water so that the end of the system completely removes, and you, when I give tours of this project that's now built, um, I open the tail end of the system, the back end of the system, and it's completely devoid of any smell of waste. And that is then pumped into uh, the fruit garden, the tree, there's a dwarf 
fruit tree garden for irrigation because it has fertigation, which is um, new, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus, which is plant food. The reason this is important is when you're in a beach condition, anything you put in a septic tank ends up on the reef in about 72 hours because the sand is so porous. And that's this, um, you know, the garden's designed as an abstraction of sargasso, but it's also designed using scenographic principles. So scenographic principles, this is tapping into the humanities for a moment, are like a Broadway stage set design in modern Broadway here in, uh, in back in New York. But you get, you know, planes, uh, uh, foreground, mid-ground, background planes. You get proscenium that separates the audience from the space and stretch perspectives by warping paths and manipulating the ground plane to make spaces feel larger than they are. But I want to point out that this curve wall here is a five foot deep system that's wrapped in a PVC liner, backfilled with gravel, and has all these hydric species, these weapon species. It has a level spreader for the toilet water on one end, and it flows through the gravel bed and is completely polished at the end. And uh, surprise how well it worked. But um, so this system is now a model for Puerto Rico to show that you have zero waste, zero discharge in the coastal environment for relatively affordable costs. This is about double what a normal septic system costs. You're essentially building a koi pond, filling it with gravel, and the, the water never breaks the surface, it stays below the gravel until it's polished. And once it's polished and safe, then it you know, through drip irrigation into the system. But it becomes a policy reference that you can, within reason, within cost reason, have zero discharge systems. And the project was called Shacks Beach. There were old shacks that used to be there that had been gentrified out through the years. But we wrapped the, the proportions of the old shacks into the, there was a requirement to have this huge wall. We didn't want it to look like a, a, a kind of military installation. So. We broke the wall down into the scale of the old shacks and brought back an early modern decorative block. Um, there's a decorative block with, you know, in the 50s were um, developed pretty extensively throughout the Caribbean. But this decorative block was, um, there's a national park in Puerto Rico called El Yunque. And this is the El Yunque decorative block. And we want to, you know, create a market for what is a fading uh, cement factory that's there. And, Kind of bring, restore this and distribute uh, into the fence system and inspire other folks to think of decorative block um, in, in many ways. Uh, but they, you can see the, as the elevation increased, the steps came down. And I have a music background and thinking rhythmically about a crescendo from one side of the project had the open beach with a lot of wind load on the wall, and the other side had a mangroves, which are more of a dark less wind. And so how do we uh, manage the different wind loads and also the increasing costs and columns and such. And so a lot of the wall was uh, treated as setbacks to create a, a stagger system that would reduce the, the cost of uh, footings and such. So it, in many ways like a sinuous ribbon wall uh, that you've seen that you know uh, Jefferson had built in UVA, but in the, uh, kind of a contemporary stagger to it. In the state of Mississippi, we're working at the state, state scale, so working at multiple scales from a small garden like you just saw to an entire state. State of Mississippi, we're fresh and saltwater interface. Um, we're looking at uh, taking outfalls and creating dunes and wetlands and islands that um, reduce runoff, uh, as well as water quality and water quantity improvements. What was interesting about this, we call it red state resiliency. It's not only in place, progressive places like New York is resiliency moving forward, even in places like Florida or Mississippi, folks are really not thinking about sustainability and causation or the science, which is unfortunate, but you can have robust conversations around solutions. And in this case, we are <clears throat> questioned by the community, you know, um, we're asking about, they don't want to talk about causation. They don't want to talk about why their dock floods at high tide. Or they don't want to talk about why there's an octopus in their front yard on king tide. But we can talk about ways to get that octopus out of the front yard and the ways to improve the redfish population, which is something they like to fish in this Gulf. So there are ways 
to code switch around and have conversations uh, around regenerative and climate resiliency. And that's really important for the democratic ideals of our nation. But just because we may not agree politically or the science, it doesn't mean half of the country needs to be pushed aside. They also need to have protection and you need to think through nature as uh, ways to achieve it and code switching is sometimes the way to get there. So that's some of the 3D modeling that we do to actually construct these dunes in the field. Um, and it shows this is the actual construction, three-dimensional construction documents that communicate to a, a landscape crew on how to build the topography. And it's really fun. You build the center of the dune with a big pole and you put strings out. And it's, uh, it's really fun to build that out because you literally build this by hand <laughs> over time. Um, I'm going to speed up because if, uh, we have a little bit of interruption at the end, so I want to catch up some time for some questions. But we're coming up on 1.30. What's 1.25? Um, so this is a district, Coral Gables in Miami. It's a you know, miracle mile. It's like Rodeo Drive for Miami. Coral Gables has this where the Prada stores are. It's all high-end shops. Uh, and so they had a huge budget, $27 million to redesign a street, which is about $50 to $60 a square foot. Normally a street design might be 10 to 20 a square foot. But it's a chance to really think through a street as a series of outdoor rooms for people and to not always emphasize car traffic, which most landscape architects lay out the same tree parallel to the road, and it just emphasizes cars. We want to create these crossing rooms that are diagonal or fractal uh, and create a series of uh, spaces that have different leaf sizes based on how quick you move through the space, so if you're walking versus driving. But furthermore, they did not have the budget to upgrade the source in that project, but we proved to them uh, so that you can have brain infrastructure, you can do the same effect of improving the, the, the storm sewer, but instead of spending it underground and saving your investment, you can have to capture a couple inches of rain just with structural soils, forest paving, and that is just as good as upgrading the system, but you're getting the multiple benefits of quality of life. But in order to do that, uh, you have to activate the entire public realm and introduce linear structural soil. It's not a single bioswale, it's a big network, and you can have a cultural layer, an economic layer of the city on, at one layer and have all the subsurface systems managing groundwater, lowering groundwater, as well as cooling the urban heat out effects through evapotranspiration. However, if you do not put the structural soil in such a monolithic manner, you can't lower that groundwater because the tree roots are not connecting to the groundwater. And when the tree roots do connect to the groundwater, they self-irrigate they no longer need irrigation, so your landscape budget goes down. And furthermore, if you irrigate with city water, it has chlorine, that's chlorox, chlorine in it, which kills the bacteria, which strips it of nutrients. It's also pH alkaline. City water is pH al alkaline. That's a problem, because plants want slightly acidic water, like rainwater, that allows them to uptake the nutrients that exist much more efficiently. So you get all these negative feedback loops when you use city water. When you allow them to touch the groundwater, you lower the groundwater in a low-lying city like Miami, and it creates flood storage for future rain events underground. They hold each other up in hurricanes, so now the tree roots can interconnect like the forest that was there a thousand years ago. So you can have coexistence of a regenerative ancient forest and a city all in one in the most intense urban environments, even like Miracle Mile. And then I mentioned the form finding comes from that analysis. Cultural analysis is that Miami is a nexus between North and South America. Miami's clouds are some of the most gorgeous on the planet. They're like postcard quality clouds. They're always these huge cumulo nimbus, white and dark gray, and then slots of blue sky. And a lot of how we mirror that experience of cloud and rain onto the ground plane. And so this non Euclidean geometry took. Uh, we found, want to find the bluest stone that we can find in the Americas. And we found a quarry in Brazil that had quartz. Uh, remember, we had a huge budget, so we were finding really fun ways to spend money. <laughs> uh, and then we had you know, some native limestone and a mix of North and South America coming together. And then we polish it in a way so that it's very muted when it's dry, but when it rains, it's the maximum amount of contrast, and that blue sky really jumps out from the gray clouds. So, that mirror of that sky. And then every joint, as you see, is staggered so that 
we're able to get porous joints and handle a thousand year rain event, and that's what this is designed for. But also every little drainage detail is an opportunity for public art. So we took, instead of a normal engineered point drain that you see vacuum trucks always sucking debris out of and clogging, this decentralizes that clog, this decentralizes the risk. We created every line drain and worked with a local artist to take the parti of raindrops that are paving pattern and express it within the, uh, the line drains with Cortan steel. And landscape is an opportunity for public art in every surface, including the sky. I proposed with the Art in Public Places program that every six months has a curated selection of a new artist for the sky canvas. The sky canvas is just a series of cables that allow for different installations that interact with the environment. In this case, it's an upside down wheat field. As the wind blows through the streetscape, it's registered in that sculpture. And if you go every six months, it's a different streetscape. And so that's what's fun about this place, is every time you visit it, it's, it's different. This is Puerto Rico. So this is Puerto, Parque Literal in Mayagüez. This is the one that influenced a lot of uh, federal policy through the years. Um, and so we had all these stormwater pipes that we found on the project when we first started, and there was no budget to steal, deal with the stormwater pipes. And much like you saw a mirror of a mile years later, Landscape architecture provides systems to not do the old civil infrastructure, but to leverage green infrastructure to eliminate the dependency on those pipes. But we could not ethically leave that pipe on that beach and deliver a project like we were being asked to. So we showed the local um, regulatory body, the DRNA, Departamental de Recursos Naturales, how to use EPA's uh, fighter remediation systems. Uh, transfer it locally and be this a, become a pilot at the scale of the whole city. Uh, and this was with the governor of Puerto Rico, the mayor of Mayaguez City, and the Central American Games Committee. And they said, as long as we keep on budget and deliver what we need as a Central American Games overflow park, then I don't see why not. We also agree we can get rid of these pipes. It's a good thing. What we got them to focus on was the bay. This isn't a park. It's a bay design that this is about healing Mayaguez Bay. In the Caribbean, you expect crystal clear water, turquoise water, and most of Puerto Rico has that, except for its urban conditions, and we found a way to get there. So we studied these pipes and what they were a thousand years ago, and adjacent to the city, there's creeks that, they didn't go straight to the ocean, and they didn't go fast. They curved, and the geometry increased its curve as it approached the ocean, and it never actually touches the ocean, unless there's a major rain event, of which there's a nature's check valve, which is a dune system, which can open and close within hours. And it's how does it do that? It does it on its own through the littoral drift. The ocean is always drifting in one direction, and the wind is behind it. So after a major rain event, this existing river would open up directly to the ocean, and as soon as the rain subsided, the sand would, within overnight, would close back up. So we wanted to find not ways to bring the whole river back, because it's a city, and it has real estate pressures and cultural needs, but how do we take certain elements of that, including nature's check valve, and reweave it back into the city, but also handle water quality, meaning polishing water in addition to the water quality, which is managing resiliency. So we took phytoremediation technologies, uh, which are well known if you're in landscape architecture, but the sedimentation bed, bacteria in the roots of the trees that polish the water further, and then uh, secondary polishing through the sand dunes. So the sand dunes were designed above to be helping with surge, but the subsurface of the sand dune was a sand that was uh, spec specified to be able to handle the polishing of that water after it leaves the tree roots to get it to uh, water quality standards that could be released into the bay. And the project was approved. We got the permits, and with two kilometers of coastline, an entire urban watershed where every single storm pipe was introduced as a massive linear uh, wetland system. But that's at the lower level, it's the wetland. Above, we have all the cultural needs of the project, where being two kilometers is influenced by the urban program adjacent to it. So where there was a high school, there's certain athletic and recreation needs, where there's elementary school, 
we have dual need of overflow parking, but when there's not overflow parking on a peak event, the soil could be used, tilled up in the future if there's lower demand for parking. But also, there's a farmer's market on these brick painters that can be popped up on Saturdays and connect the dots between the food system and the economic system. And not all resiliency systems are just living. There's a relationship between hard infrastructure, like a sheet pile wall that we brought in, as well as the living systems. And that is that one of the limits to green infrastructure and nature-based systems is that they struggle with repetitive strikes. And now with hurricanes, you might get two in a row, or you'll get three in five years. But the sheet pile wall is critical to maintaining that. But there's a, there's a correlation between them. You want that sheet pile wall to never do its job. It's the spine of the system. But the, these organs, if you will, the soft tissue of, of the green infrastructure is your first line of defense. And when they wear out, you have a hard infrastructure backup plan. And so it's not all nature, always, but it's much more cost effective to have the hard infrastructure be your last line of defense. We also design a 5,000 person amphitheater embedded in the dune system that can flood on king tides and be cleaned up easily. So we, there's some places that we couldn't elevate, but it's really learned to live with water in its definition in the Caribbean, which is slightly different than living with water in, say, the Dutch dikes and countryside. Um, and so the project, when we started construction, this is a snapshot, and the bay on a dry day, there's no, no cloud cover, no rain. And you couldn't see the water bottom. And there were not a lot of migratory fish. And the construction on the right is not a rendering, it's a photo from, uh, from a, a helicopter. But you could see the wetlands, um, and the stormwater pipes that were there would flow through the wetlands and polish through the dune system. And they, there are every few blocks you get some of these uh, constructed wetlands. You can now see the bay bottom, and there's migratory fish returning. And this is what that multi-layered system looks like. You get you know, some of the concrete clauses and some of the cultural functions on one side. And then down low, you will get layers of oysters that are hosted by black mangroves. And then the salt grass here that further polishes the water. That pipe that you saw on the beach, you trim back to nearly street level. And this is a solid containment area where the same vacuum truck they currently existing that we have, we leverage their existing maintenance program. The vacuum truck comes up on the sidewalk and sucks out the coke bottles and solids that accumulate here, and then allows the rest of the water to flow through. So it's tying into the existing maintenance cycles as well as existing storm cycles. So this, when you're designed for Cat 5 storms, there's some things that you can make rigid that survive the storm, and some things that are sacrificial. This is a photo after Hurricane Maria. Cat 5 storms struck the island. The heaviest winds ever measured and the heaviest rains. But if you notice, there was a wooden railing instead of metal type railing or concrete railing. That was because we, every 10 years, the wood is meant to be upgraded anyway. And there's a periodic cycle of about every decade was the average tropical storm, minor tropical storm that would hit. So we're connecting the dots between you know, job security and the economics and creating demand for sustainable timber, which is grown on the island. Um, so that sacrificial layer you see on the far left side, what's called the rack line, is where the surge kind of reduced by dune and reduced by the wetland. So when fresh and salt water interact, physically it slows down a lot of that surge. It's really interesting how that works. Um, so having that topography of wetland and dune and then the, the roughness of the upstream kept the surge only in the park and the adjacent properties, which are 30 businesses along the two kilometer strip, they were able to open the next business week, the next Monday. But the thing I learned in interviews from those business owners is that after the storm left, there was a band of, of, the, of the storm that left the heaviest rain ever measured in the city. And it flooded the mountains and all the streets turned into rivers. An architectural record uh, wrote about this project. And you can look up architectural record by Gwyneth Sparkless Rao in a little more depth. But sharing with you the metrics, I call this the metrics of imperfection. That is, when I was in grad school, there were sustainability projects, but no resiliency projects to look at to say, is it working? How can we improve it? 
And we're always interviewing the asset managers of our project to learn how to improve in our own office, and we share those imperfections with others. So here's what we learned. We lost uh, about 9% of the coastal forest. So these trees that you see here lost about 9%. To improve that, I would cluster trees instead of singular trees in the future um, and create layers of trees, but not a, not a monolithic planting of trees, right? Um, and then we learned that uh, some good things are that it only took two weeks to recover the park with a municipal budget. That means some city, uh, two, you know, a dozen city employees and a backhoe came and cleaned two kilometers. But adjacent to our project was a federal Army, Army Corps sheet pile wall with some businesses that took six months to recover before the businesses came back. And some couldn't come back because they're out of business for so long. But it took federal dollars to recover that sheet pile wall because it was a singular point of impact and the waves were just slamming against it and undermining it. So it took federal money six months to recover that versus two kilometers where it was just a city budget and two weeks of recovery because of the multi-layer energy distribution happening across the project. I'm going to speed up quickly, but this work is starting to influence New York City. And I'll jump to a question and answer. But this is New York City's first net zero neighborhood. And we're designing 90 acres of New York City on the coast of Rockaway Beach in Queens, uh, using designing geothermal, solar battery systems at high density. And if it works here in New York City, it can work really anywhere because of the density challenges. You can find more about this project in Bloomberg. If you look up Bloomberg Arvern East, A-R-V-E-R-N-E, Arvern East. And it's uh, New York City's first net zero neighborhood. It's under construction. Uh, we've just started phase one, but we have you know, the, the energy system planned out, the flood resiliency system that manages groundwater. And the first part you can now visit is under construction, and it's uh, a mile of New York City's first cloudburst street. That means it uses forest paving and, most importantly, network bioswales to hold one million gallons collectively, over a million gallons out of Jamaica Bay, which is the nearest bay. And it's technically hard to do that in New York City. A lot of agencies have to come together because you're managing stormwater from the right-of-way public realm, as well as some private properties. And if you're not allowed to transfer stormwater across property lines, but nature doesn't understand that. So how do our systems get in line with nature, right? And not be limited by the Jeffersonian grid and by property ownership. But then getting the technics of it. The structural soils are allowing the tree roots to connect to the groundwater and lower that groundwater like we saw in Miami. And also details that express how water can transfer from the street under a sidewalk and you hear the water falling into new parks department land with new constructed weapons. And this, you can go see it, it's uh, under construction and just wrapping up. And this is a myriad of agencies that had to come together. And it was wonderful to work with a, a great architect, Claire Weiss, WXY Architects. I helped her design a solar system on her building, and we coordinated the angles of the solar with the angles of the stairs and ramps. And what I love about architects like that, they make space for landscape thinking in their architecture. She worked from the inside out, we worked from the outside in, and met in the middle within her building. So this whole mile-long coast of New York City has uh, form finding happening at the scale of the building as well, really making that building be an extension of the cloud to groundwater system. And uh, this is a cross-section through a lot of apartment buildings that will have geothermal heating and cooling, designed the solar system, and in New York City's first groundwater management landscapes. Landscapes that are playgrounds, plazas, and parking lots, all porous, all connected with structural soil underneath, much like you saw in Parque de Terral, I mean, uh, Miracle Mile. And we'll speed up through this. Uh, this is in Puerto Rico, just a massive solar system that I designed, half megawatt, that, that survived Hurricane Maria. And again, we went through why we lost some of the solar in the storm, and these are the metrics of imperfection from the solar system. Uh, in Puerto Rico, after Maria, solar systems, about a third of a system might be lost in the hurricane. But we bolted the panels directly to the structure, and uh, this allowed only 8% of the solar panels to be lost and only 2% were lost to uh, wind shear. It was mostly because of uh, the bolts where we should expect a larger bolt. Because we were designing beyond code 
But how do you design beyond code is one thing. How do you design for these extreme winds? And we were close to it. We were really close. We've been 100% resiliency. But after the hurricane, this is the last piece I'll share with you, is helping the communities that help build our projects. And so a lot of 15% of our firm's time goes to like what we did after Hurricane Sandy, we did in Puerto Rico. We created a project called Solar Libre. So sometimes you're designing a project and sometimes you're designing a cultural act. Solar Libre was a workforce development project that I asked favors of the CEOs who produced the solar panels for our projects to normally respond quickly because I have millions of dollars in contracts for them. But in this case, I asked, I don't have a contract today. I, my father was in the northwest coast of Puerto Rico and he's not getting, I can't get through to him, but I, I know it's bad and we need to get some solar panels at scale. But we have an island, so that's the challenge. So the CEO said, I have a warehouse in Utah with 90 pallets of solar panels that I can't sell and I'm paying rent on. If I donate it to your project, um, I don't have to pay rent and it helps me. He goes, but you have to figure out how to get it from Utah to Puerto Rico in a disaster where the shipping is shut down. <laughs> so we got together, the office in New York would shut down around five or six, and around 7 p.m. we created the, the Boricua studio. So every Puerto Rican and New Rican in New York would come to our office and call everyone they knew. And these are some influential people that work in modeling agencies, some that work in all strata of New York City. New York City is a very Puerto Rican city. But everyone called everyone they knew. They're like, who knows Bad Bunny? Who knows Lynn Manuel Miranda? And somebody's like, I know Bad Bunny's manager, but he just got fired. So, okay, let's try to get there. <laughs> who knows? Like, so we found, we got Lynn Manuel Miranda's father on. He's like, all right, I'm interested. Let's do this. So he had a nonprofit called uh, uh, Hispanic Federation. So, you know, I, I called back to Utah. I, I go, we got a partner for, for logistics. And he said, um, you know, I, I, and FedEx is going to help us. So they give us, they have a brand new jet that hasn't been certified for cargo uh, commercially, but they can fly us. It's a huge 70, 777 wide body jet. It's like, you can carry a football field, a solar cell in one flight. They, they, they gave us a free flat jet, and the pilot said he donated his time, but they said, you have to pay for the fuel. I go, cool, let's find the fuel. How much does that cost? And they said, $80,000. <laughs> $80,000, we've got free, can you find a way? Like, we can get a wholesale price, get it down, but we, you know, we can't, we, we're getting offered a lot here. So Lin-Manuel Miranda's father, they kicked in, they said, we'll pay for the fuel. <laughs> so boom, we're in. And uh, so we, Several of these uh, airlifts, of solar airlifts, came into Puerto Rico. I came down with solar installers from New York who install our projects. I said, I need one month of your time to go to the island with our own food and water and not borrow from the resources of the disaster, but help me assess and find ways to get all this solar into the field for free. And that's what solar Libre means, it's free solar. We ended up doing 200 sites in the years after Maria. And it went from an emergency saving lives to long-term recovery where a lot of the, the Puerto Rican youth were interested in our projects and they were helping out. They wanted their, to have their jobs were stagnant because there's a disaster, no one's working, but their emergency was slightly over so the family's okay. And they started jumping in the truck with us and going up in the mountains and taking community centers off grid permanently with solar battery systems. And this is one of those sites, this is like the 20th site we have this solar trailer that we got to the island and then powered this emergency room. And it had a FEMA generator that was there and it was the FEMA generator break down and they closed the doors of the emergency room. And this is the only hospital for 60,000 people. And there's a lot of um, induced births after a hurricane because of low pressure. You get a lot of premature births and things. So we want to at least get the sonogram and the x-ray machines functional and the doors to stay open. We can't run the whole hospital off the solar grid, but just the basic administrative functions. And we're able to do that. So when the generator would go down, the whole hospital would go down, at least they keep the doors open and able to support a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the, the birthing uh, emergencies. And, you know, I way, way came and wanted to see Park of the Terrell, and I said, if you come, it's not disaster tourism, we're gonna to put you to work. <laughs> so I got them lifting solar panels and installing um, bakeries. And this incredible climate artist, Justin Bryce Moriglia, uh, who's embedded with NASA as a science, uh, an artist embedded with science, 
doing important climate work. Uh, check out Justin Bryce Gorigia, amazing guy. Uh, Victor Cruz, the uh, wide receiver for the New York Giants, had just retired. He's the guy that does the salsa every time. And his, his, his family's from Adecibo on the North Shore. So it just shows how a network of uh, ally, you know, black and brown solidarity with folks that come together to help the Puerto Rican diaspora come together to help the native population on the island. And it grew into a workforce development that's now led by women. Uh, and so this is the first cohort of Solar Libre. It's now an apprenticeship. And a lot of the graduates have now run the program on the island. Uh, so we certified them for solar. They were helping out, volunteering, that we got enough money to pay them to go to class, get certified nationally through a NABSEP certification. And now there's amazing women. They, uh, they're mostly high school, college age, but they it's, it's reversing the trend in Puerto Rico, which is only 17% female in the solar industry. And we're producing mostly, uh, the, the cohorts were mostly women uh, coming out. Um, and so what we've learned is they, they have these trucks, right? So it's like a huge truck that show up in one day, they're taking a community center off for it. And it's really incredible to capture that. And uh, Rosie Perez is an actor, is Puerto Rican. She had a construction uh, nonprofit that was teaching construction jobs. And we put our nonprofits together and collaborated, and we came and solarized her construction facility, and now they can operate off grid. So all these energies are coming together with the NGOs. And the last slide I'll leave here is um, the storm was in September, and by December, many months later, I found an orphanage in the mountains of Puerto Rico where the children had optimistically uh, put together a Christmas tree, expecting, of course, the lights would come on by December after a September hurricane. But it was bizarre to be in America and finding that there was no food and water for them other than a few churches who came through. And FEMA came by with a, a, a loan application for them, and that was it. <laughs> it was not much. But it was heartbreaking and optimism at the same time, where they would run a generator for an hour at a time to light up the tree. But finally, with the solar battery system installed, we did a quick countdown and you know, here are the the last comment he said uh, we don't have to hear the generator isn't that great <laughs> so, so it just shows you that sustainability and resiliency are some of the solutions. A solar panel is sustainable. With a battery, it's resilient, and you need both to get to the night. But it is the way forward. It's the only safe thing in a disaster is solar, and long term, it's the only way forward to get us out of the climate crisis. Anyway, thanks for your time. We'll, we don't have much time for Q&A, but I'm excited about it. <laughs>